One, two, three, four, now she's ready. Now it's time. A Boston girl who knows who crime. She got cats, cat or two. But if it's money down, I'm not blue. She knows I'm there. She knows I'm her. Hello, everybody. Welcome to DNA After Dark. If you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Tonight, I'll be reviewing the case of the Toolbox Killers, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. But before we do that, this is the first case I'm covering in 2024. So Happy New Year, everybody. I hope you were all doing well. I hope you had a fantastic holiday season and of course new year celebration so before we get into the case let's just say hello so hi james watson welcome kane russell chris james mr jenks nick thank you welcome hope you're doing good haven't seen you in a bit hun thank you i'm so glad you love the intro hey chrissy hello clifford crawford Linda. Uh, let's, oops, I was on the wrong episode. <laughs> okay, well, you're here now and that's all that matters. So, Okay. Uh, not sure what you're obsessed with. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, now I see you guys go back and forth. All right. You know, we haven't even started the case yet. And you guys are already getting fresh. <laughs> it is what it is, I suppose. But anyway, so let's see any housekeeping things. A cat, uh, of course, if you are not subscribed to the podcast, go over and do that because as I've mentioned once, twice, or maybe like 50 times now, the Manson Saga discussion panel, we are back. We are back to doing weekly episodes, which is amazing and I'm so excited. So if you are into just the Manson case, go over there because we get fully deep dived into the Charles Manson case. So definitely check that out. And again, that is over on the podcast. Other than that, you know, we're keeping it honest here, Clifford. We're all hung over. <laughs> you know, it's you do you, hun. You do you. If if there was ever a day to be hung over, the day after New Year's Eve, I think is pretty, pretty fair. So, so you're good. <laughs> Uh, let's see. All right. So other than that, I think that is all the housekeeping things I have for tonight, but let's go ahead and dive into this case. So, oh, hi, big sky, Scotty. Welcome. Happy new year to you. Good to see you. Uh, oh, and then also, oh my gosh, how, how could I forget? For those of you who are watching, who are not in the chat, thank you for joining in. If you want to join the chat, feel free. It's a nice bunch of people. They can be a little wild, but overall, it's a nice bunch of people. James Watson, behave. You need to behave. Other than that, everybody's great. So, all right, you guys, the toolbox killers. That is Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. So let's go ahead and dive on in. So Lawrence Bittaker was born on September 27th, 1940 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Shortly after his birth, Lawrence was adopted by Mr. and Mrs. George Bittaker, George worked in aircraft factories, which required the family to move often. The family eventually settled in California. In 1957, although Lawrence had an IQ of 138, he dropped out of high school, had several run-ins with juvenile authorities and the police. Shortly thereafter, he was picked up for car theft, leaving the scene of a hit-and-run accident and evading arrest. He was imprisoned in the California Youth Authority until he was 19 years old. Within days of being released, the FBI arrested Lawrence in Louisiana for violating the Interstate Motor Vehicle Theft Act. He was sentenced to 18 months in Oklahoma Federal Reformatory. He was released after serving only six months of his sentence. December 1960, 
Lawrence was arrested in Los Angeles. In May 1961, he was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in state prison. Yes, 1 to 15 years. A little odd, but just reporting it here, folks. <laughs> a psychiatric evaluation determines determined that Lawrence was paranoid and borderline psychotic with little control over his impulses. In 1963, Lawrence was released after serving only three years. Two months later, Lawrence was arrested for parole violation and suspected robbery. While in prison, he was again given a psychiatric evaluation. And again, he was determined to have borderline psychotic episodes. Lawrence was released shortly thereafter. In 1967, Lawrence was arrested and convicted of theft in leaving another hit and run accident. He was sentenced to five years of prison this time, but he was released in April 1970. We're going to sense a theme here if you have not already noticed. In March 1971, Lawrence was arrested for burglary and parole violation. He was sentenced to six months to 15 years in October. He was released after serving just three years of that sentence. Lawrence attempted to shoplift at a supermarket, but he was caught. An employee followed him outside to stop him. Then Lawrence stabbed the employee in the parking lot. Thankfully, the man survived and Lawrence was convicted of attempted murder. It is here while in prison at the California men's colony in San Luis Obispo that Lawrence met Roy Norris. So let's do a quick pause there, folks. There's a bit of a theme here, as I mentioned. There seems to be, one, the sentencing doesn't really make a lot of sense. I understand when sentences are, for example, 10 to 15 years or 20 to 25 years. But a sentence, for example, that he's getting here of 1 to 15 years or 1 to 10 years it just doesn't really jive that well. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. But then also we're seeing this repetitive behavior of him breaking parole, getting caught, getting arrested, getting these sentences, and then almost getting out just a couple of years in, if not just a couple of months in, with basically just another slap on the wrist. And unfortunately, this is not in episode that is just strict to this case. We see this in so many other cases and it can be really frustrating. It can be really frustrating because at the end of the day, we, we know what the end result is. We know what's going to happen. I haven't said it yet because we're still covering the case, but we know where the end result is going to take us. And you look back and you see so many opportunities where this individual or other individuals could have been stopped. Lives could have been saved. If only they were serving the full sentence that they should have been serving, that they were convicted of. If only they weren't given so many, you know, again, I call them slap on the wrists type of sentencing when somebody's repeatedly breaking parole, repeatedly violating it and going to jail and being sentenced and the punishments don't really fit basically what he's doing, in my opinion. But not sure what you guys think about that, but it was just, it's very frustrating because again, this is not unique to this case. We see it over and over and over again. All right, you guys are just kind of catching up in the chat with all the happy new years, which is awesome. Good morning, Tony, good to see you. Uh, Bella Vita, welcome, happy new year. Um, da, 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 da. Should have lived in out time shoplifting is legal. <laughs> I used to pass the men's call me my way to Cambria. Oh, interesting, Linda. Very interesting. Yeah, I have no idea, no idea what the area even looks like. So I always like it when somebody has a perspective of, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know what that is. I drive by that or that area. I think that's pretty, pretty unique perspective. Shoplifting to attempt to murder. Well, that escalated quickly. Yeah. A little bit. Clearly that crime was not planned because the employee followed them out. I know times are different now and, you know, any, you know, job that I've done, you know, growing up, you know, doing retail jobs while, you know, while you're in college to, you know, get extra spending money and whatnot. We were always very strictly told if so, 
somebody steals, just, just let them walk out. Just let them walk out. Do not attempt to go after them. Do not attempt, do not touch them. Do not, it was just very, let them walk out, call security. I mean, and, it, and that was very strict. So needless to say, there seemed to be quite a bit of shoplifting back in the time when I worked retail, but it, it, you know, we, it was very strict. Do not follow outside. And it, I mean, it kind of makes sense when situations like this happen, unfortunately. Uh, right? Yeah. It seems a lot of these serial killers are shoplifters. Um, I think I can see, I can see why you say that, Kane. I think it, de it depends too. I think it depends geographically because depending on where, you know, a, a more, if they're in a more populated area, like a big city, I think there's a lot more opportunity for kind of, I hate to say meaningless shoplifting, but from stores and so on, where in kind of smaller, smaller, more rural areas, there, there isn't as much opportunity. But with that being said, you know, does that impact things too? That would be interesting just to kind of look at on its own for sure. But I, I see exactly what you're saying. They let him off that many times. Must be MK Belter. I was waiting. I knew somebody was going to make that connection. Be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Chris James, it was definitely you who made that one. But I, I knew someone would make that. Already escalated to serial. Oh, Ari. Yeah, you guys are just joking in the chat. All good. Let's see. My neighbor's son was there for about two years for a police chase. See, like that is interesting because think of what he was, what you're saying, how long of a sentence that was just for that basis, some of the thing, you know, comparison to some of the things here. It just doesn't add up, but that's part of my whole, you know, my whole rant, I suppose. Shoplifting is no longer a crime. It does show up on like police, uh, like when you... Uh, have a, um, like a quarry done that it does show up on things like that. So is it weighed as heavily? Like if you're applying for a job or something where, you know, you need your background checked, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't play as much of it a part, but it kind of depends on, you know, who's running, you know, that type of background check, but it does show up that, that I do know. Uh, let's see. Linda, wait, wait, what? <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. All right. So where we left off, again, this is where Lawrence met Roy Norris. So Lawrence was given another psychiatric evaluation. However, this one, it did not agree with the borderline psychotic diagnosis. Instead, it stated that he was a classic sociopath. They warned that Lawrence was bound to escalate his criminal behavior, moving on to more serious crimes. He was, quote, a highly dangerous man with no internal controls over his impulses and a man who could kill without hesitation or remorse, end quote. Despite the psychiatric's warnings, he was released in November 1978 and then moved to Los Angeles. Roy Norris was born. February 2nd, 1948, in Greeley, Colorado. At 17 years old, Roy dropped out of school and joined the Navy. He spent most of his service stationed in San Diego, California. He served four months in Vietnam. In 1969, when Roy returned to San Diego, he was arrested for attempted rape. He was out on bail and was arrested again for trying to attack a woman in her home. Police arrived before he could harm her. Roy was now discharged from the Navy for psychological problems. In May 1970, while still out on bail, Roy attacked a female student on the San Diego State University campus. He had jumped her from behind, hit her on the head with a rock, and then slammed her head several times onto the concrete. Since the woman survived, Roy was only, again, only charged with a deadly de assault by a deadly weapon. He was sent to to Escadero State Hospital as a sex offender and spent five years there. When he was released, he was considered to not be a danger to others. 
Three months after his release from jail, Roy, what do you think happened? He attacked and raped another woman, a 27-year-old. Roy was convicted of forcible rape and was sent to the California men's colony in San Luis Obispo. Now, again, we're making that connection here. It is here where Roy met Lawrence Bittaker. Now that we're caught up on their backgrounds and where the world aligned that they now met. Roy claims that Lawrence saved his life twice in prison, which bound him to Lawrence according to the, quote, prisoner's code, end quote. January 15th, 1979, Roy was released from jail and moved in with his mother in Los Angeles. Lawrence contacted Roy, and they continued their prison friendship on the outside. Well, Lawrence and Roy came up with a plan to rape and kill local girls, specifically they plan to kill at least one girl of each teenage age from 13 through 19 and would record the events and not only record them on tape, but also on film. So both audio and visual recordings. Lawrence bought a 1977 GMC cargo van, which they called, quote, Murder Mac, end quote. Yes, they called it murder because it had no side windows in the back and a large passenger side sliding door. Before I get into their crimes now together being committed, let's just see where you guys are in the chat. I know I'm leaving you guys on a cliffhanger here. Let's see. Have you watched the news lately? They sell them if ever arrest, let alone prosecute shoplifting. It's also not covered at all, basically, in the news. There's so many, I mean, rightly so, worse kind of crimes that are occurring that that's going to take up, you know, news talk. Not, you know, no one's going to report and say, you know, the shoplifting was done right now. I think the only type of shoplifting we see at this time is like the porch pirates for, you know, when people get like Amazon and, you know, other shipping packages to the door and people steal it all the time. That's really the only time I personally ever see any type of shoplifting covered in the news. Other than that, it's just not mentioned. But let's see. Yep, you guys are saying that's so true. Yep. Those guys are sick. I know, Linda, I know, but it it doesn't, the episode doesn't get any better, I assure you. So, yeah. Oh man, <laughs> this might this episode might be a little bit for you. <laughs> uh, let's see. I always, yes, I always get this case mixed up with the toy box killer. Yep, yep. I can. Yeah, the names are of the like their nicknames are very similar, but the crimes are very different. And the toy box killer. That will be a case that I will be covering hopefully soon, and that will be a collaboration case. So stay tuned for that. I was, I had a feeling when I did this case tonight, someone would be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, different episode. And yeah, that's why I definitely made sure to put the names of the individuals in the episode notes for tonight, because just to clarify any confusion people may have, because it, it does get a little confusing. Uh, let's see, Russell, not you guys. The guy Tina is talking about. You know, I love you guys. <laughs> okay. So now, again, Lawrence and Roy wanted to execute their, their plan. So February to June 1979, Lawrence and Roy decided to test it out. They drove along the Pacific Coast Highway, stopped at beaches, talked to girls, and took their pictures. June 24th, 1979, 16-year-old Cindy Schaefer was picked up near Redondo Beach. Roy forced her into the van. He duct taped her mouth and bound her arms and legs. Lawrence drove the van to a row that was out of sight from the highway. Both men raped Sydney, and then Lawrence wrapped a straightened wire coat hanger around her neck. He tightened the wire with pliers and strangled her to death. They then wrapped her body in a plastic shower curtain and dumped it in a nearby canyon. July 8th, 1979, 18-year-old Andrea Hall was hitchhiking. Lawrence offered her a ride while Roy was hiding in the back of the van. Once inside the van, Lawrence offered her a drink from a cooler in the back. When she went to the cooler, that is when Roy jumped her. 
He bound her arms and legs and taped her mouth shut. Then they raped her several times. Lawrence dragged Andrea from the van while Roy left to get beer. Lawrence then took Polaroid pictures of Andrea, stabbed her with an ice pick in both ears and strangled her. He then threw her body over a cliff. September 9th, 1979, Lawrence and Roy were driving near Hermosa Beach and spotted two girls on a bus stop bench and offered them a ride. Jackie Gilliam was 15 years old and Leah Lamp was just 13 years old. The girls accepted the offer for a ride. However, they became suspicious when Lawrence parked the van near a suburban tennis court. Leah wanted to get to the back of the door when Roy hit her in the head with a bat. The girls panicked and all hell broke loose. Lawrence and Roy were then able to subdue the girls and bound them both. Jackie and Leah were kept alive for two days. They were repeatedly raped and tortured with a wire hanger and pliers. The men even recorded audio of the assaults that took place. Lawrence eventually stabbed Jackie in both ears with an ice pick. Then both men tur took turns strangling her until she died. Lawrence then strangled Leah while Roy hit her in the head with a sledgehammer seven times. Their bodies were dumped over a cliff. The ice pick was left in Jackie's head. September 30th, 1979. Lawrence and Roy kidnapped Shirley Sanders by macing her and forcing her into the van. Both men raped her. Shirley was able to escape and went to the police. They showed her pictures of Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. However, she failed to make a positive identification. October 31st, 1979, Lawrence and Roy kidnapped 16-year-old Lynette Ledford. They raped and tortured her. Lawrence then stabbed her several times while also torturing her with pliers. The men recorded audio of Lynette's screams and her pleas as they repeatedly beat her elbows with a sledgehammer, all the time demanding that she stop screaming, or sorry, that she not stop screaming. She was then strangled with a wire hanger and pliers were used to twist a cinching loop around her throat. They dumped her body on a random lawn in Hermosa Beach. They wanted to see the local reaction in the newspaper the body was found the next day, and as you can imagine, it did cause quite a public reaction. All right, quick pause for you guys, just seeing where you guys, I just threw a lot of horrific, horrific things at you guys, but had to be said in this case. So let's see. Absolutely, absolutely. Very well said. Mm -hmm. I warned you, Linda, I warned you. I said, I think this case might be a little much for you. <laughs> These guys were really sick. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> See, Chris James, <laughs> like, yeah, I agree, Linda, tune this one out. There are some cases that it's, it's too much. It really is too much. Oh my gosh, who was I talking to this past week where, was it? I forget, I forget who the context was, who I was talking to, but they mentioned the Sylvia Likens case. And I said, they asked if I knew it. And I said, absolutely. That's one of the cases I just can't cover. I just can't do it. I, I did at one point all the research, all the notes, and I just was like, I can't do it. This case, is it was just too much for me personally. And it, it takes a lot with true crime cases to get me to that level, but there's we all have those points where, you know, is it animal abuse that we, you know, that that's our hard line where it's like, we just can't listen to, you know, crimes against children. We all have those. There's something with the true crime community where you go down one, you know, one path of, you know, a certain crime and you're like, that's too much even for me. And yeah, sometimes that happens with these cases. And yeah, the person I was talking to when I said, Sylvia, like it, that's the case I can't do. I just can't covered. It's so horrific. It's so even disturbing to me, but yeah. So Linda, Danielle, I'm not able to see that story. Sylvia Likens too scary. Yeah. It's the, the torture she went through and you know, I won't get into details, but it, it's yeah. If you, if you don't know the case, you can certainly, you know, research it for yourself. It's there's, there's a lot of, um, 
a lot of information out there. There are some true crime, other true crime channels or podcasts that do an excellent job covering that case. I just, it was, it was, it's too hard for me to cover. Hi, Shelly. Welcome. Good to see you. Oh my, Russell, you can't say that. Oh my God. There. <laughs> hey, Beckham's way, way, way better. Happy. James, we're going to star that. We are going to star that. For those of you who missed the Manson saga uh, last week, it was just a chill. But yeah, Shelly was in the chat and I was just like, why don't we have Beckham? Let, let, let's just switch. Let's have Shelly join us and get rid of Beckham. But I don't, yeah, Paula kind of vetoed that. I don't know. Anyway. All right. Beckham's like a frightened squirrel. You'll scare him away. <laughs> Oh man. All right. All right. I know we, I know none of us want to get back to this case, especially Linda. If Lin, Linda, if you're still here, but all right, let's, let's get back to it. We're, we're getting there folks. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look at Linda trying to distract herself. All right. This case is a lot. Where's back home. <laughs> so, all right. So where we left off. So Roy had been telling a prison friend named Jimmy Dalton about the murders that he and Lawrence had been committed. Jimmy, he didn't believe Roy and thought that these were just made up stories. That was until Lynette's body was found. So Jimmy talked to a lawyer and they went to the Los Angeles Police Department with the information from Roy. Deputy District Attorney Stephen Kay. Let's just take a pause. All right, you guys. Almost all of you in the chat here, follow me over on the Manson Saga discussion panel. So let me, Beckham, Beckham, I'm glad you're here. So where are we in this case? Deputy District Attorney Stephen K was approached for this case. Okay, for those who don't know, he Stephen K was um, also in the Charles Manson case. So if you're wondering where that crossover is, Danny really doing the show without me? All right, Beckham, this is this is the toolbox killers. Me and you are going to be doing the case of the toy box killer. I knew I would get a message from Beckham being like, wait a minute, what about our collab? <laughs> I knew that. So Beckham, I'm doing a different case. If you were here earlier, you would know that. But all right, yeah, so... Just that pause for Stephen K. For those who don't know, he was, he's very big, very big in the uh, Manson case. So not as big as Vincent Bugliosi, obviously, but Stephen K is still a pretty prom prominent figure there. So, all right. So Stephen K was approached for this case. Police needed time to build a strong case. So they started surveillance on the two men. Roy was seen selling marijuana on the street. Two days before Thanksgiving, 1979, the police arrested Roy for parole violation, simply on the marijuana charge. Lawrence was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and raping Shirley Sanders. Roy waived his right to counsel and argued with interrogators for a while. Eventually, he confessed, but stated he was a reluctant accomplice to the, at, to the murders that were planned. And of course, they were all carried out by Lawrence. While on trial, both Lawrence and Roy were charged with five counts of murder, kidnapping, forcible rape, sexual perversion, and criminal conspiracy. Stephen Kay agreed to waive the death penalty and grant a life sentence with parole eligibility in return for Roy's testimony against Lawrence. But according to his statements, girls had been approached at random, photographed by Lawrence, offered rides, free marijuana, in jobs and modeling. Most girls, they turned the offers down, but others were abducted forcefully. Detectives counted 500 photographs of smiling young women among the suspect's efforts, or sorry, effects. February 9th, 1980, Roy led police to the shallow graves where the skeletal remains of Leah Lamp and Jackie Gillum were recovered. An ice pick still stuck out from Jackie's skull. 
Stephen Kay, however, was committed to seeking the death penalty for Lawrence. Well, Lawrence, he denied everything. He testified that Roy first informed him of the murders after their arrest in 1979. All right, before I get to the outcome of the trial, let's see where you guys are in the chat. Now that Mr. Backham knows what case that I'm covering tonight, welcome. You're only a half hour late, but that's okay. Linda, yes, yeah. There's a, yeah, there's a difference and that does get very confusing. So there's the toolbox killers in the toy box killer. So, oh, <laughs> yes. So hopefully we'll get to the other one soon. The other one, the toy box killer is a collab that I'll be doing with none only and yours truly, Mr. Beckham. So uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you, Linda, yeah, you can't, no, don't, the, when me and Beckham do our collab, don't watch it live. I don't even suggest watching it. That one's, it's, it's a, it's a heavy case. It's a heavy, I mean, a, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of the cases that, that we cover, or just that true crime covers in general, you know, they're all absolutely horrific. That one adds a lot of other elements to it that make it very, very uncomfortable, but I'll, I'll keep you guys posted when that happens. Stephen K is Bugs' spirit animal. No kidding. No kidding. Stephen K from his mother. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Russell. I'm totally, totally out of it. Oh, wow. These two are the worst. Hi, Doug. Good to see you, hun. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty bad. Pretty bad. I won't watch that one. <laughs> oh my God. Or, or yeah, I, I, I suggest that one. You just wait for the true crime and chill that I do later that week. Yeah. Linda, I know I'll pass on this. I'll take a pass on this. <laughs> After I read the block, Dahlia, oh my God, I'm afraid to sleep. Which book did you read about the black Dahlia, Linda? There's an excellent one that I, oh gosh, um, I have it downstairs. I can totally picture the cover. I'm blanking the title, but I did recommend it in one of my true crime book recommendations. Really, really good. Uh, Paul Cass actually recommended that book to me, which I was very surprised. I'm like, Paul, you're not even a true crime person <laughs> and you're recommending it. And it was a, it, it's a good book, a very good book. I'll be sleeping with my light on tonight. <laughs> All right. Black body. Okay. Okay. That's not the one I have. Interesting. Well, let me know if you recommend it. I'm always down for true crime books. As you know, I have a pile, like a stack of books that I got for, for the holiday season as gifts. And then I had a list of books that if I didn't get, you know, from as gifts or, you know, you know, some family, they they don't really know. And they're just, oh, here's an Amazon gift card. It's like, thanks. No, that's awesome. And I ordered, oh my God, like five or six more. And then the other day I was like, oh wait, there's another one I didn't order. So I need to order that. But I have a stack of books that I need to read and talk about with you guys. So if there's another one I need to add on that list, Linda, let me know. Let me know. Danny, it was good, but thanks his dad killed everyone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair. Good to know. Good to know. What? You're referring to my uh, co-host, Paul, for over from the Paul cast, Manson Saga. And I, I don't know this nice Paul that you speak of. No clue. How many books did I get for Christmas? I got, I want to say like seven seven gifts, different books. And then I ordered six. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I have, a, I have the, I don't keep my red books in here until I read them, just so they don't get mixed up. So I have them in another place and there's a, it's a stack. It's a stack of books that are unread that I need to get to. So 
Yeah, I just, I do this every time, this time of year. I'm just, I'm such a book nerd and I look forward to the holiday seasons. Like, oh yay, I'm going to get more books. And then what I, you know, what I don't get, I just purchase and yeah. And one of the books was the book that y'all were talking about in the chat from Manson Saga. It was one of the uh, books about the LaBiancas. So I'm really excited for that. I hadn't even heard of that until we were doing our show over there. And one of you guys talked about it and said some really great things about it. I'm like, all right, done, purchased. I'm on it. Absolutely, Linda. Yeah, yeah, I feel you on that. All right, let's finish this case and wrap it up, you guys. So where we left off. So Stephen Kay, he wanted the death penalty for Lawrence. And of course, Lawrence was denying everything. February 17th, 1981, Lawrence was convicted of rape, torture, kidnapping, and murder. He was sentenced to death. Lawrence spent his time filing frivolous, frivolous lawsuits against the state prison system. There were more than 40 lawsuits by October 1995. That is wild. For example, in one case, he claimed that he has been subjected to, quote, cruel and unusual punishment, end quote, when he received a broken cookie on his lunch tray. State officials paid $5,000 just to get the case dismissed. That is insane. That is insane scene. I have a saying, you know, my friends in real life know, I, I say this all the time, my co-workers, my co-workers hear this from me at least a couple of times a week. I don't like the concept of rewarding bad behavior. It really, like, I have like a few pet peeves. That's one of them. When bad behavior is rewarded, Oh my gosh, that's, oof. I am not a happy Danny, not at all, not at all. So to have all these crazy, just frivolous is the best word to describe it. All these lawsuits, again, one of them where he is saying cruel and unusual punishment because a broken cookie was put on his lunch tray in the state officials paid just to have it dismissed. What does that teach? What does that show? What does that open up for so many other prisoners? It just, I don't like rewarding bad behavior. And especially where it sets horrible examples and opens the door for so much else. Because if you think about it, when it comes to the courts, and I know in a perfect world, there, you know, every case would be tried, you know, right as it should, and so on and so forth. That's a whole other whole nother conversation. But a lot of times also when lawsuits are filed, they, you know, they will reference previous similar suits. And what happens for one sometimes has to be some has to be taken into account for the next. It just has to be because then you get into unfair discrimination and, 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 and all of that. And again, that's a whole nother topic in itself, but they opened the door with this. So wild. When I read that, when I was researching this, I had to stop and be like, I knew this case, you know, I knew the the relevant details. But then when I was getting into like the nitty gritty of this, I'm like, how did I not know this? And I was just infuriated, absolutely infuriated. Sorry for the rant on that, folks, but I thought it was worth just pointing that out that ridiculous. Yeah frivolous yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely oh let's see what you guys are saying beckham is on the edge of a scene i'm sure uh uh michelle phillips was friends with hotel's daughter oh i hate our society and that was, that was in 1995. That, think of it now. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean. <laughs> oh, God. Ridiculous. Okay. All right. So we just ended with that lawsuit. 
So let it be noted that California prisoners are permitted to file their lawsuits for free. This was back that again, back in 1995. I don't know if that's still the case, but at the time this was, this was allowed. So kind of makes sense. He had nothing but time, nothing but time. Is it infuriating in a waste of taxpayer money? Absolutely. But what does he have to lose? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So Roy, he was also convicted, but he did not receive the death sentence per the deal. So he received 45 years to life with the possibility of parole after 30 years. In 2009, Roy was up for parole, but it was denied. December 19th, 2019, Lawrence Bittaker died while awaiting execution. February 24th, 2020, Roy Norris died in prison. Police believe that Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris might be linked to the disappearance of 30 or 40 other victims. That is the case of Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, the toolbox killers. Thank you guys for sticking around for another episode of Danny After Dark. And thank you for sticking around for one that was a little bit, this one was a little bit tough for you guys. And it was pretty graphic and, and I completely understand that. So for those of you who are still watching or made it through Thank you. You certainly did not have to. And those of you who aren't seeing this part at the end because you checked out and you're like, this one's just a little bit too much for me. Totally understand. Totally understand. So any questions or comments you guys have about this case? Because there, there was a lot to it. There was a, definitely a lot to it. Let's All right, you guys are making other book recommendations in, to each other in the chat, and that really makes my heart really happy. <laughs> Vote for Danny, tough on crime. <laughs> I'm going to star that one too, Russell. Thank you. Vote for Danny, tough on... Oh, shit, that one's getting a star as well. All right, all right, all right. Oh, thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Clifford says incarceration should suspend the vast majority of individuals' rights while they are locked up. I completely see where you say that. And I think a lot of people would agree. I'm just thinking the, the whole aspect of, yeah, it's unfortunately this, this case does bring a good spotlight on because this is not unique prisoners filing lawsuits left and right are completely not a unique thing and it just goes to show how much time and effort and energy and resources that it that it wastes and as much as i still don't believe that the state should have paid five thousand to have that that case against Lawrence dismissed. I really don't think so, but it kind of shines a light of you can see the frustration of it's just easier to do this than just to keep entertaining this and wasting time and resources and all of that. But I, I completely, I think a lot of people would agree with exactly what you're saying. Uh, let's see, what is this? Vote for Danny, the right choice for Paul cast, the right choice for America. Oh, what the hell let's start that too <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely and it's one of those you can kind of see why Stephen K made the deal that he did with with Roy you know he needed he needed to put ultimately he was going to get both of them in jail but he really wanted to really wanted to get Lawrence behind it and I think that begs the question for you guys how much do you, obviously Roy and Lawrence were trying to pin a lot of it on each other versus taking accountability and responsibility for their parts in it. But it begs the question, do you guys think that they were both equally culpable? Do you think maybe one had more influence and did more than, than what the other one did? And if so, who? Or 
Or do you think regardless, you were together, therefore you were both involved. It doesn't matter if one, let's say, you know, physically was more, um, more attacking one of the victims. Bottom line, you were there as well. So you're just as culpable. You know, what, what do you guys think about that? Ultimately, they're both dead and gone now, and they both were served the rest of their lives in prison. And I'm not surprised that Lawrence had, Lawrence died while awaiting execution all those years later, because I mean, we just see how death row is. It's very slow, very, very slow. I mean, over 20 years, it was almost 25 years before he died. But again, still, still awaiting execution. So. Uh, let's see what you guys are seeing. Clifford says most rights to privacy, entering into contracts, etc. Not sure how it is, but how it should be. Okay. Yep. Kane agrees. When the time comes, colonize Mars with prisoners, the new Australia. Oh, God. Uh, oh, God. What was it, James? Recently, I was talking with somebody. I can't remember if it was like a comment somebody said on a po I want to say it was a podcast. And it wasn't one I listened to. I, I, I think I know which one it is. And I'm not the biggest fan of that podcast. So I'm not going to say the name of the podcast. But it mentioned something to the effect of like, put all these criminals on an island and just let them have at it with each other. Just kind of survival of the fittest, so to speak. And it, it, it was just shocking, shocking. And the person's like, oh, do you listen to this podcast? What do you think? Did you hear this? And I'm like, oh, God, coming from this podcast, I'm not surprised. But it was very, it, it just reminds me of your comment that you said tonight. That That's why I bring it up. But so you're not alone in the sense that someone or people think, let's just move the problem over here and somewhere else. They can figure it out themselves. Survival of the fittest type of thing. Linda says, yes, both uh, Lawrence and Roy were both guilty of sin. Okay. Yeah, Clifford says two peas in a pod. If one has a wormhole, the other one is covered in worms. Very good point. Yeah. Um, appeals can take up to 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, clever, it says, my family clan was rounded up in Scotland, scattered in Nova Scotia, the Carolinas, and Australia. Oh, interesting. I want to hear this podcast now. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's a popular true crime podcast. It's just not for me. It's not for me. I know so many people who listen to this podcast and love it. Absolutely love it. It's just not for me. It's just not for me. Oh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Kane says five years were appeals and then you're executed. For what? Uh, I, sorry, Kane, I think I'm missing the context of what that was in. Which one, Danny? No, 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 no. No, I don't. I I don't believe in bashing another another content creator. I I really don't. Even if I, is that's not my style. Um, so that's why I, I I not not gonna name the podcast. It's just it's not for me. It's not for me. But again, there's so I have so many friends that love that podcast. So. Just talk. And I've tried, I've tried multiple times to listen. And I'm just like, oh, I can't get into it. But to be fair, some of the ones, the podcasts that I swear up and down and love by will not miss a week. Half, as soon as it gets released on my phone, I'm like, all right, driving out and doing errands and putting it on. It's not, it's not, you know, doesn't fit what everybody else is looking for. So that's fine too. That's fine. Not for you, dog lovers. Oh, come on. I, I grew up with dogs. I grew up with dogs. So no, no, I'm a dog lover too. Just I'm a crazy cat lady now. That's all. I think death row inmates get three appeals. I didn't realize, I wonder, oh, sorry, I'm trying to say 10 things at once, Linda. Is that 
like uh, state specific. And I don't, I thought, I didn't think that people were limited to three appeals. I know some of the cases that we, that we've covered here, um, they've definitely received more than three appeals. And even if you go over to the Manson case that we listed, you know, over on Manson saga on the podcast, they, a, quite a bit appeal, uh, appeals, like way more than three. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where, where that comes up, but that could be to a specific state and it could be absolutely right. I just, I don't know offhand. James, I heard they were dog lovers up in Pentagon. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, God, you guys. All right. Well, if there are no other questions or comments about this case, I'm going to wrap things up for tonight. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Jinx, <laughs> your timing is absolutely impeccable. Danny, I'm not sure I thought that's what it was. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know one way or one way or another um, in regards to, I, I thought that they were allowed more than three. Uh, good lawyers appeal each objection individually. Well said, Clifford. Well said. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, thank you again for joining me for another episode of Danny After Dark. Again, if you are not subscribed, please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any other cases that I do each week or also for the true crime and chill that I do with you guys each week, which is really going really well. And I'm so excited to have started that with you guys. I know I was, I didn't do that for a long time. I just kind of covered solved cases and that was it. But there's so much in the news that goes on. And, you know, I message quite a bit with, you know, some of you guys on Instagram when, when news breaks on something and it's like, you know, you guys want to talk about it and I want to talk about it too. So that's been such a great platform. So so if these cases aren't your cup of tea, but true crime and chill is every week, that's cool too. Hang out with me there. And usually most weeks I have Mr. Beckham on with me as well. And yeah, it's great banter back and forth. And we, we don't always think the same on some of these cases. So it gives a little bit of uh, different perspectives when we talk about the cases that are ongoing. So all right, everybody, enjoy the rest of your week. I will see you later in the week here for a True Crime and Chill episode. And then I will also, for those of you who follow um, over on the podcast, Manson Saga Discussion Panel, I will see you over there on Thursday for uh, part of the case that we will be going in depth into. So see you guys on either platform. And until next time, remember, we don't live in darkness. Darkness lives in us. Bye, everyone.